Uh, welcome to this uh, uh, presentation. I know we are running a bit late, so I tried to keep this brief, so uh, everybody has been time for lunch and so on. Um, all right, um, so uh, as an introduction, um, my name is Mikko Lammi. Uh, I'm from working in AppCloud Finland as a senior developer. Uh, I flew here from Helsinki. Our main office is located in Helsinki, though we have a location here in Singapore as well. Um, people usually uh, fly from sin to hell, but I did it the other way. Um, I've been working five years in AppCloud, um, doing all kinds of uh, mostly backend stuff. Um, Unlike many of you here, um, I'm not so hardcore PHP developer, but I've done that also in the past, so um, I know something about PHP. Um, anyway, our goal is not to be the um, PHP provider, but the general hosting provider for all kinds of um, developer-related uh, projects and, uh, uh, of course, production hosting as well. Um, and. Um, I'd like to uh, talk today about a bit of um, uh, scaling the I.O. performance, especially in the cloud-hosted environment, because um, usually people in the cloud, uh, when they talk about scaling, it's about uh, CPU or RAM, but uh, rarely about the uh, I.O. operations. Um, and nowadays, of course, we have lots of different products to help to scale the I.O., but the basic problem still remains. So. Um, I will show you some uh, basic information about this and some examples and um, some demonstration of how our products can maybe help with this. Um, and um, as a part of my history with PHP, uh, well, as many speakers were already mentioned, things were a bit different uh, years ago. Uh, my first touch with PHP was uh, when I was doing my compulsory military service in Finland. Uh, 15 years ago, uh, we had this opportunity to end up some sort of uh, special operations groups after the uh, basic training, basic military training, and I somehow ended up uh, doing the uh, PHP programming for the uh, Finnish Military Public Affairs Division. And back then, there was a heated situation in the world politics, uh, and uh, uh, well, uh, there's actually a crisis ongoing. Uh, US-led coalition was invading Iraq. And uh, Finnish uh, Defense College wanted to um, create a special website where they could put up some analysis about the um, situation, where their um, military specialists could write uh, updates about what's going on, and so on. And uh, we, Conscripts, working on the uh, web website development, we had like two weeks time to set up entire side uh, from scratch with a built-in CMS system. And this was 15 years ago, so uh, tools were a bit different back then. We used PHP 3 and basic LAMP stack for that, but uh, we didn't have really much clue about scaling the website. And the thing was that uh, uh, before that, most of us was, the, was uh, uh, only familiar with some PHP hobby projects, but this website since it was the uh, official website of the uh, Finnish Defense Forces. It was mentioned in the uh, public news, um, in the television, and in newspapers, and suddenly it became very popular. It got lots of hits, and uh, we were suddenly faced with uh, lots of scaling issues, lots of performance issues, and we had very limited resources. We had like three physical servers, just one for the database and two for the web front, uh, front end, and didn't really had much clue about how to, how to improve the performance. But we improvised a lot and learned a lot in a short time, and those experiences were quite valuable, and I still, still think that um, some of those principles apply. But what we couldn't do back then, we couldn't just add uh, more resources like more CPU or more RAM or more servers in the line because those were all physical hosts. There were no cloud hosting back then, no virtual machines. It was just plain, plain hardware and uh, operating system running on top of that. And of course, um, we didn't use PHP for any 
uh, actually military stuff. Uh, we didn't program weapons with PHP. It was just this public website uh, telling about the uh, uh, specialist analysis of the Iraq crisis situation. Um, so um, what's so great about cloud nowadays is that it's so easy to scale things up. You don't have to actually configure every new physical server or install it or uh, put it to the racks or, or anything like that. Um, another photo from the past. This is just truly 20 years ago uh, in our small company. It wasn't upcloud. Uh, it was a different company back then. We were doing uh, web hosting 20 years ago. And it was basically like this back then. It was more like running stuff from your basement. I remember when we got our first rack and we were about, now we are professionals, now we have racks. Before it, it was like just some more or less desktop computers doing stuff. So scaling up website was a bit different challenge back then. Nowadays, you could just go to your cloud provider and click some new uh, servers and that should do it. Is it always enough? Well, um, to define the uh, scaling apps in the cloud problem a bit more, um, this might be a bit naive definition I'm going to give you. Uh, I know that uh, many of you are very experienced developers and probably have faced this kind of uh, problems before. But still, I'd like to uh, kind of focus what your uh, IO problem here is, because at least from our provider, uh, our perspective as a service provider, we still see many of our users running quite old applications, applications that have been built with a um, test and proven LAMP or LAMP stack, uh, but they are built more or less as monolithic apps, so they don't scale that easily. And here's probably the reasons why. Well, here's the uh, very basic setup. We have the server which has resources like storage, CPU, and RAM. Then we have the application software. Here I'm simply putting it as a LAMP stack. Or, and uh, then we have the uh, actual application, which is written in PHP. You can, of course, think about layers in a bit different manner, like web server being on top of the application code. But anyway, I guess you get the picture. Um, so here's the basic app. So um, this could be like a Magento web shop or WordPress site from our perspective. We got hundreds of them running on top of us. And usually when the customers encounter a spike in their traffic, what they first do is that they increase the flexible resources, CPU and RAM. Because of course, many uh, sysadmins think that we need to have more RAM or we need to have more memory, and that will make app go faster. Well, in some cases it will. Uh, some applications scale up this way, even without tuning any configuration parameters, like usually when you scale up your RAM, it doesn't help immediately unless you like uh, configure your um, web server or uh, PHP or uh, MySQL to use more, more of it. But um, in any way, this is a sort of easy and nice solution. And then, what if it, this is not enough? Well, then we have always option in cloud to just duplicate the server, put a load balancer in front of it, and run two instances, or even three or four or five. That should do it. Well, of course, if your application is uh, capable of running uh, independent instances, it will work this way. But um, what about uh, if you have shared data that needs to be accessed from any of these instances? Then you need to have some sort of shared I.O., some sort of shared storage, and that creates a totally new kind of problems. It's not, uh, then you can just uh, put uh, uh, additional instances. Um, so I.O. is uh, nowadays maybe, people think that I.O. might be a bit of outdated problem because we have so much caching going on, like everything can be stored in, in memory, memory is cheap. Uh, 
why do you need to think about disk when you can have 100 gigs of RAM in your server and keep everything there? Well, in some cases, you have more data than word of 100 gig. What about if you have uh, one terabyte of data that you need to access and cross-reference? I don't know what kind of website that might be. Maybe some very popular cat photo site where people could write the, rank their cat photos and comment them and so on. But we've seen applications that actually have quite huge resource needs. And uh, applications that have gone, gone this big uh, without uh, their developers realizing the need of the scaling, at least uh, in the early phases of the architecture design. So, um, basic I.O. program usually is that uh, you have two sorts of I.O. You have reads and then you have writes. Uh, reads usually consist a larger part of the application usage. Uh, here in the reads, uh, I guess they're also like doing any uh, any sort of file system operations that gives you status of the files, like um, getting the latest modification timestamps or anything like that. And writes could be like uh, either direct writes from your application or it could be database writes, but still something that you have to persist and then be available to other processes to read. So uh, writes um, uh, or reads, reads are usually like uh, you have uh, static resources like uh, uh, images or CSS data or um, cached content and then dynamic content that needs to be every time re uh, read from the disk or from uh, your storage because it could have changed and uh, you just don't have the latest copy. And writes here um, could be also dynamic data that you get from your application, from your users. And uh, then you have um, logs. Logs here could mean um, anything that the application or the uh, underlying application stack and uh, a server software writes, but your application doesn't immediately need to provide new content for the uh, clients. So um, it could be access logs, it could be error logs, it could be uh, database replication logs, anything like that uh, depending on the configuration. Uh, what is common with it is that it will uh, stress the uh, underlying storage. It will uh, mean that you have uh, storage operations going on, which might then in turn um, slow down the uh, read operations where you are uh, reading data for your customer, uh, for your application and its customers. So in um, some cases, uh, of course, you could probably minimize the writes like uh, in production system, don't write any debug logs or um, keep the uh, application logs and the uh, server logs in the separate storage or send them over the network. But there could be use cases where you just have to write things down in quite a detailed manner. For example, like you might have some uh, legal requirements to log every user coming to the website and have uh, detailed access logs. There are so many different use cases that um, it's not easy to give a simple solution that would work for everything. So um, usually if we want to improve the uh, I.O. performance, it's about reads. And in that sense, uh, having more caches will usually help a lot, caching the data that, so that it doesn't have to be written from the uh, disk every time. That's a common solution. But, um, it doesn't help with the writes. Uh, what might help is to direct some of the writes to the separate storage. Um, here again, when the image says logs, I mean all kinds of data that application doesn't need immediately, like it could be database, uh, binary logs, or anything like that. So that's easy solution. You have separate storage system that handles uh, part of the uh, load, like separate log disk, in your virtual server. That's quite easy setup and it usually will help up to some point, but not forever. Uh, adding more caches on the read side will of course again improve performance, but still if your application is write intensive, no matter how much uh, caching you do on the uh, serving the data side, it still comes down to the fact that if you get lots of new data that needs to be written down and available immediately for the um, 
other processors reading the data, then you have a bottleneck, and it's the I.O. bottleneck. No matter how much CPU you can put, or no matter how much RAM you can put, the disk is still the uh, underlying, underlying uh, impacting thing here. Uh, so, of course, you could ha uh, do multiple servers and have uh, shared storage, like um, there's many, many storages available, good old NFS or cluster FS systems that provide uh, multiple servers uh, read and write access to the same storage at the same time. But still, the storage is a single storage, and it has limited, uh, limited uh, performance, limited I.O. capacity. So uh, if you have more clients accessing the same storage, it will not improve the performance. It might actually make the situation worse. So that won't work too much. So then there's some common tips for sharing the I.O. load. Again, I suppose uh, this is nothing new for you, but uh, still I'd like to go through this because uh, at least with the existing applications, there's no easy way of doing this usually. So um, most common way is to sort of uh, divide your data. Use partitioning or share, uh, sharding, which means that you separate your data to different physical entities, totally independent units, based on some sort of key like user ID or a product ID or whatever unique ID that might be. So he, in this example, we have three different independent storages. And then we have a sort of a storage director uh, which, which gets the um, applica application's um, key. In this case, it could be uh, the user ID, which is divided by three, and then we get the uh, reminder uh, modulus and use it as a director. Uh, there could be more advanced setups like uh, um, hash keys or multiple composite keys or multi-level uh, sharding. Uh, and uh, of course, many database products do this for you. You don't have to think about this, maybe. That again depends on how your application is built. Are you building a new application from the scratch or are you probably trying to fix some legacy old application that has lots of internal data structures, lots of, in the, lots of dependencies between. Um, in this case, it might be useful to actually know how about the databases do this. To go to the details and uh, think about uh, yourself, uh, maybe you could do this also without a database. You could uh, use this kind of setup with just, for example, if you have lots of, lots of uh, small files that you have to store and serve, you could use this kind of sharding architecture with the files as well, just use the file name or metadata as a key. Well, of course, uh, it gets complex with this kind of setups. It's not easy to set up and it's not easy to maintain. So um, before going this kind of setups, uh, uh, it might be worth thinking about what are the pros and what are the cons doing this. Well, pros. Uh, you have smaller units of uh, data to manage, so it will create increased performance. And then you can do um, fetching data in parallel, like uh, getting data from multiple different storages at the same time, which will then result uh, faster combined data performance. And then you might have fault tolerance, but having this kind of setup doesn't automatically imply that it will be fault tolerant. Uh, it's the totally different, different story to uh, create redundancy than create the, uh, just the uh, better performance. This is like the same thing as the good old uh, hard drives and write disk setups. Uh, you could uh, have performance or you could have redundancy, but uh, doing both uh, gets expensive. So uh, cons then, uh, well, it's indeed more complex to set up, so um, more work needs to be done, more servers to maintain, configure, and so on. So uh, uh, if you are not uh, the uh, administrator for all this, maybe you have separate sysadmin doing this for you, or DevOps team, they might be uh, annoyed to 
set up more complex system, but uh, that always dependent on the uh, business case requirements. Um, uh, yeah, and um, the joints are of course slower. Uh, if you have data that needs to be fetched from uh, multiple locations, and data fetching from location B is dependent on data fetched from location A, the, and these are stored on the different backends, then the uh, uh, partitioned or sharded architecture really doesn't help that much. So uh, it depends on how do you choose your uh, data sharding uh, um, strategy. Uh, if you choose uh, your keys in the wrong wrong way, it might be that uh, this setup might actually be slower than having just a single uh, storage backend. But uh, it depends. It needs some kind of uh, testing and tuning and uh, doing it maybe many times over. I iterations are usually a good way to improve performance. Um, and then uh, there's also risk for uh, having part of the data unavailable. If you have uh, multiple different storage hosts, one of them just might go down. And depending on your application, it might still work with partial data, but uh, some of the data might not be available. I suppose uh, everyone who's ever used Facebook has seen uh, sometimes that there has been some glitches where not all the not all the user profiles are av available, and I suppose, uh, of course, Facebook systems are far more complex, but the basic reason is that some of the backend storing some user profiles have not been avail available at that moment. So that kind of things could happen. Um, well, tools for setting this up. Um, nowadays, we have lots of uh, modern uh, NoSQL databases, which provide uh, sharding options by default like MongoDB, Cassandra, or even Redis. Um, I won't go into details of how to set these up, and each of these have a bit different strategies, strategies and each of these have a bit different pros and cons. But um, one thing is that uh, these are maybe not so much used with PHP. I think these are more like um, used with the uh, uh, Node.js uh, or Java. But with PHP, at least with the legacy applications, we still have more like a traditional databases. Um, just a quick uh, hand gallop. Um, how many of you have implemented uh, any NoSQL databases with your PHP applications? OK. And how many have you used like traditional databases like SQL or Postgres? Yeah. That's what I would assume. So. Um, only a small part have used this. So um, they are not automatically better in the sense that they provide sharding functionalities. There's, of course, always a use case. And the, of course, basic use case for doing this is that you have a massive loads of data and massive loads of data that needs to be constantly written and written. If your uh, database consists only like 100 rows, there's, there's, of course, no need for going all this, but if we are talking about hundreds of millions of rows or data entities, then this might be handy. So these traditional SQL databases, um, they do have some tools for setting this kind of uh, sharded setups up. And nowadays, at least, um, well, Oracle has some built-in tools, but as always, they are expensive. Uh, MySQL and its derivatives have some third-party products that uh, can be used to set up that kind of clusters. And I think Postgres also has um, some kind of uh, sharded partitioning support nowadays. But they are not so built-in systems that with those um, other kinds of databases. So um, if you have legacy application that's using uh, old, uh, old database, uh, well, not all database, but traditional database. Then uh, changing it to use uh, shared, sharded um, database, sharded uh, storage architecture might require, require quite a lot of re-engineering. And um, at that point, uh, it's important that you know your app and know your data. And even more important, 
it is when you are building something from the scratch. Good question is that should everything nowadays be able to scale to like a web scale? Should you build your every application in a way that it should be capable of handling 100 million users from the beginning? Probably not. There's no point of doing uh, early optimization too much. Um, but still, I think uh, traditionally PHP applications have not been built uh, too much with this in mind. So um, if you are writing something totally out of scratch, it might be a good idea to think about uh, how to uh, set up your data, how to uh, make it uh, so that it doesn't have too much uh, dependencies if it would be split to multiple different storage backends at some point. So, um, yep. So, if you are building a new app from scratch, it's of course architectural uh, decision to do it that way. And if you are modifying some legacy app, then it might be worth of digging actually how it uh, uses the data and would there be some use cases that would uh, would benefit from doing some sort of optimization in this sense. And then there's of course uh, non-blocking I.O. options. I'm not sure if the previous talk about React mentioned this, but um, this helped to some point, but uh, not uh, with the uh, multiple rights. So um, then we come down to the part that what if it uh, happens that you just have some legacy application or even a modern application uh, with um, sharded databases, uh, disk architecture that has been scaled up to the best possible, but it still won't uh, give you enough performance. Well, luckily there's option that you could have faster storages available even in the cloud. Uh, so here's a word from our sponsor. <laughs> so um, AppCloud is um, a growing uh, hosting provider. Uh, we provide uh, services in the um, uh, infrastructure as a service model. Uh, so in customer responsibility, it's usually setting up the operating system and the applications and uh, anything that runs on top of them. Uh, we don't provide uh, LAMP stacks by default. We provide just Linux servers and think that the end users usually know how to configure them best and we focus on the um, underlying hardware, underlying virtualization and underlying storage and try to make it as fast as and good as possible. Um, we have currently uh, eight data centers around the world, uh, one here in Singapore, uh, two in the uh, US and the rest are in the Europe. Um, now, if you get our promo code uh, and try to deploy a server, you might notice that deploying a server to, uh, for example, Singapore or US locations might take some time. And we are aware of this and we are working on this and I promise that uh, during the rest of this year, this will be much better. But um, uh, we also have uh, nice features like uh, built-in uh, complementary uh, private networking between each of the uh, data centers. So you don't have to set up anything extra or pay anything extra for having communications between your servers. That also might help with the creating applications that scale and uh, communicate with each other over the private network. And we have, of course, good 24-7 support available. Uh, and here's some pricing information you can find more on the, our website. But. Um, Let's go to show about how we can help you with setting up applications. Uh, we have some resources like our app API documentation. Uh, then we have a collection of how-to articles. And then we have our um, application libraries, one in PHP and others in other languages available in our public GitHub. So I'm next going to show you some short demos. Um, let me change the view.
So um, we have this nice feature called uh, initialization scripts, which helps you to um, set up some basic things on your server on the first run. So um, I created uh, one that will set up a very simple LAMP stack server. This is probably something that you don't want to do in production. You probably want to do instead like setting up the um, uh, basic um, Ansible host there and use that instead. But just for the demo purposes, how to kick up a PHP LAMP running application in short time, I have this. So um, let's uh, deploy a new server. This won't take too much time, hopefully. So I'm going to deploy to Helsinki 2. Let's Use just for the cheapest plan for a moment. Helsinki prices uh, have a bit additional extra compared to uh, our other data centers because production costs there are a bit more higher. So we have lots of uh, built-in templates, which uh, means that you don't have to actually um, install your operating system. You just select existing template and then the switch key. And then I use this in script here. Okay, let's get up. It should be up and running in about one minute. Um, in the meantime, uh, let me show you the um, IO demo. So um, uh, we provide the quite fast storage is by default for every customer. And just to show you how fast they are, uh, I'm showing you the uh, FIO tool, which is used to benchmark uh, IO. First against my um, own laptop here. So this is my local disk here in my own laptop. Some of you might be familiar with this one, this tool, like it's most important thing here in the um, random writes is to measure how many different random writes you can get from the seconds. And here you can see that my local MacBook Pro performs about uh, about 60k IOPS per second, which was quite good, much much better than traditional spinning disks, much much better than your usual cloud cloud hosted server. But um, let's see. Now I think we have probably our server up and running. Let's check. It might take some time. To, okay, yeah. It, it's up and running, and here we have LAMP stack installed there already. So um, let's log in. In. I used it root logging by default. You could, of course, define other uses as well. So um, server has my SSH key already deployed in. And here we have a um, the uh, latest LAMP stack installed, just like I specified previously. So um, let's install here as well. I should have put this also to that um, installation script so it would be in there by default, but no matter, it will be there in no time. And um, then I have to find my cheat sheet to go be the um, file command here. So let's run this same test here on the cloud server. And we can see it's performing about the same or even a bit faster than my local MacBook Pro server. And this is the performance you can get with our uh, 
five dollars per month servers with the storage. So, how does this uh, translate to actual application performance? Well, if you have a server that does lots of I/O requests, like uh, storing the data database or writing data from database, it will be quite significant improvement compared to some traditional spinning disks. Here I have uh, other server which uses our uh, older storage backend, HDD. It doesn't use Max IOPS. This is a different one. So if I run this here, uh, well, it's capped to 1,000 IO apps per second, which is, of course, much slower. But this is like performance you might get in many other cloud hosting providers for your storage. And if you set up a complex application like Magento Shop, it will truly show up uh, how this translates to the actual application performance. So, um, in uh, this, uh, besides of the uh, user interface, you could also uh, set up s uh, servers from the um, API. Here's e example in XML format how to create server from API. Here's the uh, same script. Same script here. So um, let me just finally show this. Yes, so this is uh, output from our API. It started to create a server and it will be up and running in a few minutes with the same kind of setup as the previous one. So um, I think uh, time is getting up here. Um, if I would have more time, I would like it to do the actual uh, Magento shop demo, but um, it seems that uh, setting up the Magento's from the scratch in short time was a bit too uh, too complicated because I haven't done it uh, in a long time, and surprisingly, uh, latest Magento was not compatible with the PHP 7.2 by default. I suppose there are people here who know how to set up this in like switch of a hand, but uh, for me, as a backend developer, for like a backend infrastructure developer, it was a bit uh, a bit too much uh, in this short time. Anyway, uh, thanks for uh, listening. I hope you got something out of this. Uh, we have a booth over there um, in the hallway, so feel free to come to talk to us and ask about our systems and services. And uh, we also have some swag to give away, and of course we have the uh, $50 credit for new users if you register now. So um, thank f thanks for watching, and I uh, hope you enjoy your uh, rest of the conference. Thank you.